Hi everyone, my name is Mike Benoit, Head of Marketing at Assure. And today we're gonna to talk about a topic that's in some ways not new, but for so many small and growing businesses is new. So uh, COBRA, uh, you sure as heck wouldn't know what it is by its name. Uh, it's from a law that was passed back in the 90s, the Consolidated Omnibus uh, Budget Reconciliation Act. That sure doesn't say that basically employers over 20 employees now need to provide continued health insurance for their employees, but that's really what it means. So we're gonna unpack what COBRA is, what businesses need to comply with this law, uh, it, it, you know, who pays, how does it work, who's eligible, it, it, and really try to unpack the topic so small and growing businesses can stay compliant, and not just small, and small companies, but mid-sized companies who are already out of compliance, but don't even realize it. So uh, I have the perfect guest joining me today, uh, Heather James, uh, if you're a regular uh, watcher of this show, uh, you've heard Heather before, she's our benefits operation manager uh, at Assure in our Tampa office. She's an amazing person, she lives and breathes this every day. Uh, and Heather, welcome to today's conversation. Thank you, happy to be here. Okay, so I did my, my super impressive thing that I said uh, what COBRA is as an acronym, <laughs> The Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Uh, I don't think anybody needs to know what uh, how to, how to, uh, what, what the acronym means. Can you please tell everybody what the heck is COBRA? <laughs> um, so I know you were very impressive um, busting out what the what the acronym and what that yeah, means. I, 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 I impress myself with that one. Absolutely. Um, so yes, it is it is a federal law um, governed by the Department of Labor. Um, so this basically it allows employees to continue the active benefits they had while they were working with their employer or while they were on their active benefits. So this is people that experience a job loss. This is people that, you know, maybe they go part time. So they're still actively working with their employer, but now they're losing those active benefits. So COBRA will allow them to continue those group plan benefits. And one thing I like to stress the most is COBRA is not an insurance. Um, a lot of people think that COBRA is its own entity, it's its own insurance plan, but really COBRA is the continuation of the benefits that you had. So you're still participating on that employer's group plan. Right. So that, that that's it. It is not an insurance policy. COB, you might think of uh, continuation of benefits. That's not what COBRA stands for, but that's really what it means. That's kind of how I think about it. COB, right. it's, a, it's your legal obligation to provide employees to have continued access to their health coverage. That's and correct. We're going to jump into uh, what companies must comply, what are the trigger events, uh, who's eligible, who's not, all that kind of stuff. But anything else, big picture of what the what the law is. Uh, uh, in, in in what businesses need to do to comply before we jump into the details. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is continuing group health plans. So, you know, when you say group health plans, this is going to be, you know, the benefits that you're offering from medical to dental to vision, you know, EAP plans, um, flexible spending accounts, HRAs, um, and this impacts anybody with 20 or more employees, um, private sector, state, local government employees um, that have 20 or more employees on more than 50% of its typical business day in the previous calendar year. So this could include both your full-time and part-time employees that are also counted to determine whether that plan is subject to COBRA. So a lot of times employers think, oh, well, you know, I only have, you know, 20 employees, but, you know, half of them are part-time. Um, so you know, it's, it, that's where sometimes employers don't think or they don't realize that, you know, they have to offer that benefit. Um, so it's really important for them to understand the employee account they have and the participation that they have um, to make sure that, you know, they are offering that benefit to their, to their former employees or to those employees that are losing those benefits. And Heather, I want to, I want to get into more of the details in a second. Can you tell me, tell us just though, what are the legal requirements of the employer. So, okay, I've got an employee, um, they, they work for me, uh, they are leaving the company, we'll get into what those trigger, qualifying trigger events are later here, but they leave the company. Um, what, what physically, mechanically do I have to do uh, to comply with COBRA? There's a, there's a notification process that I have to provide notification in a certain time period. Can you, can you unpack that for us? 
Yep. So it, it actually all starts with the initial notification. So there is an initial notice um, that's kind of the pre-COBRA paperwork um, that goes to any of your benefit eligible employees that join your benefit plan. So this explains to the employees what their COBRA rights are, you know, should they lose those active benefits. So if they're reading that notice when they, you know, start as a new hire or join the benefits, you know, they're not surprised to understand that, you know, this is coming should they lose those benefits. Now, the employee only really needs to be on the plan for one day to make them qualified for COBRA. Um, so the employer does need to notif you know, notify that employee with their COBRA notification. So that's going to have all the rules and regulations supporting COBRA, how to continue it, what their date of event is, when their COBRA would be effective. That also will include their election form. So that way the employee has the opportunity to fill out what they want to continue. So that's going to be the plans that they were enrolled in at the time of termination or benefit loss. And then they would, you know, submit that back in to continue those benefits. Um, the employer has 30 days from the date those benefits end to get that to their employee. Okay, so this is not a legal obligation to provide the health insurance, whether no, regardless of how that was done, you know, what what insurance company provided insurance and who the underwriter is, none of that. It, but this is not the obligation to provide insurance yet. It's the obligation to provide the opportunity for continued cover, uh, coverage on that same insurance. And so first step here is the legal obligation to notify the employee. So if the employee was on your health plan even for one day and then they leave for a qualifying event, your job as the employer is to notify that employee uh, within how many days? 30 days from the date their benefits ended. Okay, so your job as the employer is to notify the employee. What, what, what else from an administration standpoint must an employer do to, to forget about supplying the insurance and just being a good human, but to the, the legal requirements. So it's notification, now, what if an employee chooses not to elect COBRA benefits? What is the legal obligation? So they're not required to elect. Again, it's just an opportunity to continue those benefits. So, you know, they may be starting another job. They may not need these benefits, but it's really designed and created to offer a temporary solution until they find other benefits. So whether they start a new job, maybe they jump on a spouse's plan, um, maybe they go to the marketplace. Um, so really the employer's only obligation is to get this notice out to the employees, to the last known address that they have on file and to get it to them, you know, within the, you know, the time restraints. Um, they don't have to follow back up with the employees, you know, to make sure they're gonna take it. Um, they really only need to really move into phase two is if someone actually chooses to elect to continue those benefits right so the legal the compliance requirement for businesses uh the burden is not huge for step one which is employee was on benefit plan even if it was only for one day they leave the company for a qualifying event and you simply within the 30-day period you notify the employee of their rights to choose if they de if they de decline and they don't want to uh, continue their benefit plan and, and, and pay for it um your legal obligation is met correct mm -hmm. correct now where it gets complicated for businesses to stay compliant is when the employee does elect to uh to, to participate in cobra because now you've got a non-employee on your health plan and there's a collection of fees and stuff we'll talk about payment and stuff but stick on just the logistical the mechanics of what is legally required from the employer if the first if the former employee does elect COBRA coverage right so if they do choose to elect those benefits you know as the notice will tell them you know where to return those election forms and payment um, COBRA does not need to be reinstated until that person actually elects and makes that first month payment so then at that point, the employer would then notify the carriers um, to let them know to reinsure that person back onto the plan. And it is retro reinstated back to the date their active benefits ended. So, you know, even though employers have a time frame to get this out to employees, and employees do have 60 days to make that decision whether they want to elect those benefits, that COBRA coverage is reinstated with no lapse in coverage. 
So the employer would then notify their carriers, and in most times that coverage is reinstated right back onto their active policy bill. Um, and that employee will basically get added back to the bill, and then the employer will continue to pay for that person on their bill, just like they would with the rest of their active population. Okay. Um, one more wrinkle, and I know I'm stealing a little bit from future topics here. Um, speak to the retroactive capability for an employee to elect. So an employee could, you could, you could be uh, compliant that you notified the employee of their right to uh, elect COBRA coverage. Mm -hmm. They could decline that coverage in the moment. And uh, after that 30 day period, they get sick, hurt, something bad happens. There, there's a retroactive component here, right? Correct. So they, I mean, they do, they have 60 days. So, you know, you might ride it out for about 30 days, even 45 days, and then you think something happens, okay? Something happens to one of your family members. Um, you can then still elect at that point. A lot of people will often elect by the 60th day just to kind of ride out the timelines because once you elect, you have 45 days to make that first payment. So a lot of times people might wait and elect on that 60th day, just in case, just in case they don't wanna miss that window to still be able to elect those benefits. And then they still have some time frame to catch up those payments. Now, it is still retro back to the date the active policy ended. So they would be responsible for those retro right. payments. Um, yeah. But you know, they do have the time to be able to do that and to still think about, you know, what they need to do. So a lot of times people will securely just elect just to be on the safe side to not miss that opportunity. Um, but they do have that time frame, um, you know, to make that election. So you, as the employer, you have a legal obligation that within 30 days to notify uh, the uh, former employee of their rights to elect COBRA coverage, they have up to 60 days to elect the coverage. Mm -hmm. right and they have 45 days from that period to pay the bill is that right right to make that first payment so they'll have 60 days they'll have 45 days to make that first payment now if they're electing right away they'll have 45 days to make pretty much a month worth of payment now if you're someone that's you know waiting out that 60 days that 45 days could encompass two months worth of payment so Going forward, though, the payments would be due at the first of every month, and the employee does get a 30-day grace period to postmark that payment or to make that payment online, um, depending on you know what they're utilizing for COBRA services or if they're doing it in-house. Um, we do go by that postmark date, so if someone is you know waiting till the very very end to make that payment, um, they have the ability to do so. So the 45 days to make the first payment, and then any future payment going forward would be the first of every month. So forgive me, I'm just going to keep recapping because I want this to be really clear for, for, for especially small businesses that are growing and have not had to deal with this yet. Their legal responsibility is the 30-day notification. Uh, the former employee has 60 days to elect, another 45 days before they make their first payment uh, if they chose. on the if they So if they elected uh, to participate in COBRA on the 60th day, another 45 days, that's 105 days mm -hmm. post-employment that someone has to pay. If they did, they they you couldn't skip. Oh, I'm not going to pay for Cobra the first month. I'll just pick it up in the second. They'd be retro if they if they retroactively decide to elect. They're paying for that entire period, correct? Correct, right? Because the whole idea is to not create that lapse in coverage. So there's no break in coverage from the time that their active benefits ended. So so for an employee, they have the the benefit for an employee is not that lapse in coverage. Even if, they, even if it means retroactively paying a couple months premiums to cure that lapse in coverage, right? Something bad right. happened, uh, a family member gets sick and, and they need care and it far exceeds the monthly premium. Uh, that, that That's why the law exists, is for employees protection. For the employer, this former employee, now that someone has elected, regardless of the mechanics of 30, 60, 105 days later, whatever that is, if an employee has elected, what is the legal responsibility of the employer to collect payments? How do they collect payments? Uh, in, 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 in what, what, if any, communication with the employee? And then for how long must they legally provide this continued coverage? 
Right. So once they do make that decision to elect, you know, there there is a confirmation that you send out to them. Um, you know, even though the COBRA packet does represent what those premiums are, um, in most cases, employers will send out um, or a third party administrator will send out billing payment coupons or a register of some sort, letting them know what those monthly premiums are. Um, those in premiums can include up to a 2% administration fee. So you do have the right to um, charge that additional 2% that basically covers mail cost and stamps and, you know, getting that information out to the employees. Um, and then they'll be sent their billing information. And then, of course, you know, depending on what's communicated in that packet of what their payment options are, you know, if they're using a third party, you know, oftentimes there are ways to make those payments online. Um, and then if you're doing it in-house, you know, most oftentimes, you know, those employees are instructed to mail a check to their former employer. Um, and then to continue with those payments each month. And then again, from a futuristic standpoint, they're due at the first of every month with that 30 day grace period. So the employer will continue to keep the benefits active um, for that employee as long as they're continuing to pay each month. Um, now, for instance, there are even some cases where, you know, if depending on what the rules and regulations are for that particular insurance carrier, you know, there sometimes can be disruptions where the coverage may be inactivated. If someone's waiting to that very, very last day to make a payment, you know, the carriers do sometimes have, um, you know, regulations with how they're set up to, you know, retro terminations and things like that. So just giving an example, you know, if, if you wait to the very, very last day to make your payment, but maybe it doesn't arrive, you know, five, six days later into, you know, the next billing month, you know, there can be times where the carrier may inactivate it until they realize that a new payment has come in and then that yeah. covers you them reinstated. So I always like to point that out too, because a lot of people get nervous, but, you know, it is a costly um, continuation. And a lot of times, you know, people are, you know, kind of strapped and they're waiting to the very last minute to make that payment. So just wanted right. to add in there that, you know, there are, you know, some things that can be done towards the end of that month, you know, when those types of things happen. Um, the other responsibility of the employer too is, you know, as you go through renewal, um, this is another big one, um, if your costs change, because the employee that's continuing COBRA, you know, they're on your group plan. So employees that, you know, no longer work for you that are continuing benefits through COBRA, they're also entitled to the renewal period and open enrollment. So as the prices change, the COBRA premium can change um, just like they would for the active employees that are going through open enrollment as well. Um, so there is a responsibility too of the employer to communicate when there are premium changes to that plan um, as they go through renewal as well. And Heather, did you say how long they must, how long COBRA coverage must be offered? Oh, so they can have that up for just a standard termination qualifying event um, or loss of coverage. It is 18 months. They can continue those benefits. All right. So here's here's what I would here here's what I want uh, small and growing companies to hear. Um, the legal obligation, uh, the compliance obligation, is not that big around COBRA for the initial notice. A, a, a employee leaves, it was on benefits, and you, and you give them notification. That's the easy part. What gets really complex really fast is later on when employees, because remember, these are employees presumably who don't have another job yet, um, and therefore they don't have income. They're going to have, uh, many will have financial challenges, and so they're going to wait until the 11th hour on electing benefits. <clears throat> they're going to wait till the 11th hour on paying bills. Um, in most employees on a health plan, health insurance plan, from an employer's perspective, you're just taking this out of the, you know, the, the weekly, the bi-weekly, the monthly paycheck, right? So just like you pull taxes out of a uh, 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 pre-tax, uh, post-tax, you're pulling a uh, uh, benefit costs out, right? The employee could portion, the employer portion, but it's all a, it's all a pre-paycheck event. So most companies have this kind of hardwired systems and processes in place that they're pulling out the health insurance costs from the employee's paycheck and goes through whatever their finance process is to then pay those carriers uh, in its set. Most employers do not have a mature process to how, how do you, how do I, do I send an invoice? Do I, how, how do I collect money a couple hundred dollars at a time outside the payroll system? 
And then how do I take that money and reconcile it in an account to pay these insurance carriers? And what if the person paid late, uh, they were postmarked on time, but maybe he came late, the insurance carrier kicked him off. Now I'm in this back and forth. That's where it can get super complex, super fast. So uh, it, 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 am, I, am I being overly dramatic here, Heather? Is, is that really where, where you see employers struggle here? Oh, for sure, because it is. It, it's, a, it's a second job to somebody that might already be doing five or six other things, um, you know, within their organization. And it's a lot to maintain because, you know, you might have an opportunity where somebody doesn't pay the full premium. So now they're short and you have to send them a reminder, you know, to let them know that, you know, we that they owe additional premiums. So, you know, it, it it's a lot to to track and especially there's a lot of dates surrounding it. So the grace periods and first payments due and, you know, and then if somebody does terminate for non-payment, you know, you have to notify them of their termination. Um, so there's just a lot of moving parts. And, you know, sometimes if that's not your day-to-day -day job, you know, you could miss one of those steps. And, you know, obviously that's never a good thing. So, um, so let's, before we, so I'm hanging a long, a long time here on the definition, but I think this is important material. Um, mm -hmm. What if you get it wrong? So if I'm, uh, I, let's say I, I just hired my 20th employee and I, I now have to comply. Um, and I'm, I have a low, I have a great work culture. I have very low turnover, but you know, I, I have, I have one. No big deal. I'll figure it out. This can't be that hard. So I, I don't. Uh, uh, I, I try to do this in house, but I but I make a mistake. What bad things can happen? Whether it's fines, penalties, what what recourse is there uh, when when you get this wrong? You know, ultimately, you know, in working with the Department of Labor for so many years, you know, their their main objection is let's right the wrong. So you know, they understand that there are times that you know you might have the wrong termination date or the letter may have gone out a little bit late. Uh, obviously, once you become aware of the situation, your best bet and you're always your first bet is to get that notice out as soon as possible. Um, you know, the recourse obviously could turn into if you're not willing to get that information out or you never send that information out, you know, they could face penalties up to $100 per day per family member. Um, so it can get very, very costly um, if you're not, you know, making the wrong or right and getting that, you know, proper notification out to that employee, um, especially if they're contacting you, if they're saying, hey, I didn't get this. You know, there's sometimes things get lost in the mail and that's understandable, you know, so getting that information out, you know, making sure it gets out. If someone says they didn't get it to make sure that, you know, you're resetting that notification out. Or even if, you know, you're going through an internal audit and you realize, oh my gosh, you know, I missed somebody. Um, get that notice out ASAP. That's that's the best recommendation that we have that the DOL offers is, you know, right the wrong and get that information out as soon as possible. Um, you know, just to ensure that, you know, that employee is getting, you know, what what's right to them and making sure that they're giving that opportunity to continue those benefits. Right. So, so how I think we, I would coach businesses to think about this would be um, mo most federal, most government institutions, state, federal, um, they, if it's a taxing authority, they want their money. They're not going to settle the stop until they get their money, but they will work with you as long as you show good faith effort. In this, this, in this case, the, the Department of Labor, they want to help you right the wrong. Um, ignorance of the law is no excuse. They, they will uh, force that to happen. But if you're, uh, so I, I think you should expect uh, the Department of Labor to probably be a, a helpful yet forced compliance partner here. Um, but just know if you do get it wrong, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And Heather just said $100 per employee, per family member, right? So a family of four, $400 a day, you get this wrong for a month, um, you're talking a lot of money in potential fines. And if the Department of Labor, so in, in any other case with a wage and hour dispute, maybe you're Maybe you have an employee makes the complaint that you they deserved overtime and you were you were not paying overtime to them. What typically happens is not just dealing with a single employee dispute. That empl the Department of Labor is going to conduct an audit and they're going to go back one, two, maybe five years. The okay is this a recurring practice? Because they don't know if you're a good, honest citizen, a good employer or not. All they know is that they got a complaint about one thing. 
and boy, there's probably something more here. We're going to, we're going to investigate. Right. right. So uh, we're not trying to scare the hell out of people here. Um, I think the scariest thing is you said it well, Heather, that this is, this becomes a second job for somebody. The administration of this becomes just simply hard. Uh, but know that the, the, the department of labor who runs this thing and there's, there are real financial teeth, uh, behind this thing. And, uh, if, if they do get involved, which shouldn't happen, but if they do, you should expect to be audited and they're going to look for what other mistakes you've made, uh, uh in your past. It, again, am I overstating that? Is there anything else you'd add before we kind of move on to uh, which employers must comply? No, I, I think you said it all as well. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's talk through the criteria. So, so we mentioned twenty employees. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk through more detail about what that what that threshold is. Right. So again, it's it's going to be twenty or more employees on or more than 50% of its typical business day. So that count is gonna consist of both your full-time and part-time employees. They are added together in that count to determine whether the plan is subject to COBRA. So each part-time employee counts as a fraction of a full-time employee, and then the fraction equals to that number of hours and the part-time employees they work divided over the hours of the employee must work to be considered full-time. So I know that's kind of a lot to unpack there, but I mean, honestly, a lot of times people think, oh, this is just my full-time employees. Um, so no, because potentially your part-time employees could go full-time and then could be benefit eligible. And in some cases, some part-time employees can't be eligible for benefits as well. Um, so, you know, the 20 or more employees on or more than 50% of its typical business day in the previous calendar year. So that's you know, that's probably the easiest way to say it and for people to understand. And, and I think the general consistency is we actually even have some smaller groups that, you know, offer it as well, just because they just want to make sure that, you know, they're doing the right thing. But um, 20 or more employees, 50 percent of its typical business days and, you know, based on the previous calendar year. And so this is where uh, every year staying compliant as a business becomes more complex because laws typically layer upon themselves <clears throat> state laws layer on federal local on state uh and then federal on federal right so here we have from the mid to late 90s uh cobra which draws this line in the sand of 20 employees uh 2000 what nine the affordable care act um, mandates that employers over 25 employees must provide insurance. Um, what what should uh, employers understand about this interplay between those two laws? So, like, uh, clearly everybody 25 employees and above must comply with COBRA because they must because by law they they have to provide benefits, right? Right. Um, but these but what about these employers who are maybe they're more than 20 employees? Um, but they're less than 25 and therefore they don't provide in, uh, health benefits. What, what obligations do they have? So it's, it's only going to be your 20 or more employees that are offering those group health plan benefits. So if you're not offering those group health plan benefits, you don't have anything to offer from a COBRA standpoint. So, you know, if you fall under that threshold where you don't have to offer um, a lot of employers now, you know, might, you know, take other options where they're, you know, participating or, or contributing to, you know, maybe an individual policy that the employee seeks out on their own. Um, so this is for the 20 or more employees that are providing group health plan benefits. So even if you're not offering a medical plan, but you're offering a dental or you're offering a vision plan, you know, those are also eligible plans that need to be offered COBRA as well. Um, so, you know, kind of the rule of thumb and, and what we share with, you know, our employers and partners is 20 or more full-time employees that are participating in any of your group health plan benefits that you do offer as an organization. Okay, very good. Anything, so that one's pretty straightforward. Anything else on, um, maybe maybe if you could, this little clarification on uh, uh, a lot of businesses, especially small companies are seasonal, right? Um, what, you're a ski lad, you're up in the, in the winter, you're a landscaping company, you're up at, or a golf course, you're up in the summer. So how, how does seasonality play into the employee accounts? It, it's pretty much the same thing. Like I said, you're you're kind of looking back, you know, from the previous calendar year. So, you know, if if you're having, you know, 
the typical business days in that previous calendar year, you want to include that in your count. So it's always kind of good to look back from the previous year to look at what your employee count is, um, especially because there are a lot of seasonal, especially like school systems and resorts and hotels and things like that. Uh, so it's always good to just do a look back over the last year, over the last calendar year, to see where your employee count ranges. Um, this way, you is, is that, that the, you know, the law says it's a it's a one year look back to calculate that average. Right. So it's you know typical business days in the previous calendar year. Um, so that's where the look back is kind of continuing. It's it's really more from like kind of a twelve month period. Got it. Okay, helpful. All right, so now let's get a little more detail in, into actually which types of benefits. So the you got the obvious biggies of you know health, dental, uh, medical, dental, vision, but um, you can get into gray area. I think real fast, and maybe maybe the, I'm sure the law is very clear. You know it. I would like you to explain it to me. It can get gray real fast when I think about maybe more Cadillac plans for health. When I think about uh, growing fringe benefits, maybe around pet insurance or or you know, still in the realm of health, like disability insurance, it's a health related event, but it's disability. I mean, what can, can you help draw clearer lines for us? Which benefits are covered, must be covered and which ones are not? Yeah, so a lot of your life insurance policies, things like that, those are not, you know, mixed into, you know, what's considered COBRA eligible. It's pretty plain and simple when it comes to your medical, your dental, your vision, your flexible spending accounts. Um, that's another one a lot of people miss um, because flexible spending accounts, you know, are given as an option to continue under COBRA if they're not overspent. So if you've contributed, you know, say $1,000, but you've only spent 500, you have the opportunity to continue the remainder of that $500 under COBRA. So you don't get to continue it for the full 18 months. It would only be for the remainder of that plan year. You know, so if your plan year's calendar year, you would only be able to continue it through 1231 for this example. Um, so a lot of people miss that, not realizing that, you know, they can do that. And again, it's only when it's not overspent. So if you've contributed, you know, $50 and you used a thousand of it, um, then obviously you wouldn't be eligible for COBRA. Same thing works for your limited purpose FSAs, which are, you know, your dental and your vision um, flexible spending accounts, um, HRA plans. Um, those are the big ones. Um, EAP plans, um, those are also another one that can be continued under COBRA. Um, but the life insurances, you know, hospital cancer policies, things like that, you know, that you would have through, you know, more of like a a voluntary type insurance, um, those are not required to be offered under COBRA. Okay, and forgive me, I, I want to unpack, we got some acronym soup happening here. Um, so uh, FSA, flexible spending account, mm -hmm. uh, FSA health reimbursement account. Correct. Um, and what was the other one uh, you talked about? Um, There's an EAP oh, plan, so that's the employee, employee assistance program, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, unpack those three for us just a little bit more about, so I think it's straightforward. Everyone will understand if you provide health insurance, basic medical, you provide vision and dental, those mm -hmm. must c c continue to cover. But um, I could I could envision, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a 40, 50 person uh, company and my benefit carrier packaged up some EAP, some employee assistance programs bundled in with my offering. I really don't even know what it is. I don't, because I don't take advantage of those EAP services personally. And all of a sudden I'm on the hook for, not a, all of a sudden, but I'm on the hook legally to continue the EAP uh, uh, coverage. But mentally I'm thinking, oh, that's not part of the health plan. Can you, can you bring some clarity there for us? Yeah, and that does happen. That's a, that's a fair point too. There are a lot of bundling with plans. Um, so you mm -hmm. might like your medical and dental is kind of a package deal and, and the COBRA packet will indicate that, you know, when that's going out or it should indicate that if it is a bundled plan, you know, indicating if you elect medical, you know, dental is also part of that. Um, EAP programs. Okay. And, and, we, and we should pause. When you say your COBRA uh, uh, package will do it you're i mean you know speaking self-serving here that, that's what we do that's what you do for clients so when Correct. you send one out it does but if someone's not using our service or somebody else's service these are the things that their cobra packages must contain right yes 
So, and it's usually in the naming convention of the plan and it's often, you know, communicated in that COBRA packet and it should be included in that. So, you know, for instance, if you're saying, you know, I have, you know, the following medical plan with dental. So the bundling name will include that in there. So, you know, if your plans are tied together, that should be communicated in the naming convention of that plan when it's communicated out on your COBRA notification. So for instance, like an EAP, an employee assistance program, if that is covered under the medical, you know, you're know, you getting the opportunity to continue that should you elect that medical plan. Now, if it's a separate plan, um, a lot of times I've seen with employers, EAP is a plan that the employers cover for their employees. So they're paying for the cost. The employee may have never seen a cost associated with that you know, on their insurance or on their paycheck stub. Um, but a lot of times when you go on to COBRA, you know, the employer is no longer contributing to that plan, just like they wouldn't contribute their employer portion to, you know, your medical, your dental, or your vision. So you might see EAP as a separate, you know, line item on your COBRA packet if it's not bundled in with your medical plan. Um, so that is communicated on the COBRA notifications, should be complete, commu blah, communicated on the, uh, the COBRA packet, um, you know, just to define the plans and what's separate and what's together and what's bundled. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, so let's talk about trigger events. So <clears throat> if someone <clears throat> storms off and quits their job, are they eligible? If we fire them for non-performance, are they eligible? Uh, they have a life event where they, you know, uh, Got to move across the country. Are they eligible? So, so uh, talk us through the legal requirements of of employee yeah. eligibility. Um, so, popular <clears throat> technology for termination is going to be your involuntary involuntary termination. So, you know, if you're voluntarily leaving the company, um, you are entitled to COBRA. So, even if you're quitting your job. Um, you are required to receive that COBRA packet. If you're being terminated, whether it's fired, laid off, um, reduction in hours is another one. Um, if you're losing your you know, benefits due to reduction in hours, so maybe you go part-time. Um, those are three very popular ones, um, but those all need to be offered COBRA. Um, death of an employee. So if you are um, the employee or the employer has an employee that passes away, that those family members need to be given the opportunity to continue those benefits. Um, right. So if they have a spouse along with children, they would need to be offered COBRA. Um, a child that um, turns 26, for instance, say your plan ages off, you know, ages out the employee's children at 26. Those children need to be offered COBRA. That is considered a qualifying event for the employee to notify, you know, the members of that family that have aged off the plan. Um, becoming eligible for, you know, are entitled to Medicare. Um, divorce or legal separation. Again, that's another qualifying event. If, if your employee, you know, goes through a divorce or is legally separating, um, and that employee notifies their employer of that information, and, and that is something that the employee would need to notify their employer, they are given the opportunity to continue the benefits their ex-spouse or potential ex-spouse to be. Um, so they can continue up. Now, the only difference between your terminations and reductions in hours and voluntary terminations, death of employees, divorce, children that are aging off the plan or lose their dependent status, um, they are actually going to fall into a different bracket as far as how long they can continue COBRA. So where your terminations, reduction in hours, voluntary, involuntary termination, um, those are going to be your normal 18 months um, you have to continue those benefits where, you know, a death of an employee, the spouse or the family members are entitled up to 36 months. Um, divorce or legal separation, again, there's another one where they're entitled to 36 months, as well as a child that is losing their dependent status on the plan. They are also given the opportunity for the 36 months. Um, so just another reason, you know, like we were saying, Mike, is it becomes a second job for the employer to know all of these things. Like if an employee terminates versus, mm -hmm. you know, an employee that yeah. has a child that is no longer eligible, knowing those time frames and how long you have to offer COBRA, um, you know, is, is extremely important. Yeah, and I, and I teased the question out the way I did it on purpose, just because I think a lot of times as, as growing companies think about, you know, HR compliance, it's so easy to co-mingle concepts from different laws, right? So um, 
if someone quits their job, are they entitled to uh, unemployment, right? That, I, that I'm paying into, uh, paying for, uh, premiums into, uh, versus if they, uh, do I still have to pay, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, allow COBRA, uh, well, th this is a standalone law. It's not tied to uh, your benefit eligibility rules at the front end of employment. It's not tied to unemployment rules uh, at the back end of employment or retirement uh, uh, laws around say 401k or anything. This is a standalone law that has its own requirement and uh, uh, whether you love the person, hate the person, regardless of the, of the conditions of, uh, of their termination, uh, they're, they're, if they had health and benefit, health benefits with you before, they are eligible. It, it really is about that simple, isn't it? Pretty much, and and you'd be surprised. There are a, a lot of a lot of people out there that don't realize that if someone quits their job, they are eligible for COBRA. It's actually a very popular question. Uh, a lot of, especially small groups, maybe they don't have an HR department. Maybe it's you know somebody that's handling multiple other facets of the organization, and and maybe doesn't even realize that. You know, they think, oh well, they quit. Um, it, it's it's a huge question that comes up all the time, not realizing that, oh my gosh, if they actually quit their job, I have to give them the opportunity to continue benefits. Um, and the question and the answer to that is yes. Um, so, you know, again, it's just another another thing on their plate that they have to worry about and wonder and question, you know, if someone's leaving or, you know, if, if they're asking them to leave um, and not to go too, you know, uh, crazy, but there's also the termination of gross misconduct, which is also another very popular one, but I always like to bring it up because, you know, if you have an, a termination of an employee because maybe they were stealing or, you know, maybe they were fighting at work, um, there's a huge area, gray area, and it's really up to the interpretation of the employer of what they consider gross misconduct. Um, but again, it does allow you an opportunity to not offer COBRA in that situation. But again, I always steer employers away from that because nine times out of 10, if the employee fights that, they, a lot of times the Department of Labor will side with the employee. The core system sides with the employee. Um, it's always just good to offer COBRA no matter what in, in regards to, to that. Because what you, know, what you may to determine is gross misconduct, the Department of Labor may not, may not side with you on, on what your interpretation of that is. So, so, so two, two things for me, Heather. Number one is always go back to look at what was the intent of the law in the first place. The intent of the law is to provide continued coverage for employees, regardless of their reason. Um, exactly. Because it certainly is perceivable that uh, you might want to quit your job and get up and leave that day without two weeks notice because your boss is a real jerk, right? Or maybe it's uh, uh, an unsafe working environment and, and you you need to leave now. <clears throat> that's a that's a reasonable scenario. And so the law was was designed to provide you with the ability so that you, at least if you had to leave in those circumstances, uh, your 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 family's not at risk of not having health insurance and then going bankrupt because somebody has a heart attack. Well, you, you know, four days after you quit your job, right? right. So that's that's the intent of the law. <clears throat> Another really really good reason to not challenge this at all is really a, a, our our next topic. Well, who, who pays for it? The burden here, I think, is, if it hasn't become self evident already, is the administration. It's not it's not the expense. It could, this is probably a layup topic. Uh, uh, Heather, but who, who pays for COBRA here? So that would be the employee um, or the qualified beneficiary. And the reason I segregate the two of that is, you know, there could be a situation where you and your wife, Mike, are offered COBRA, but you're not only going to continue the benefits for your wife. So you have the ability to do that. So any of the fam family members that are offered along with you for COBRA are also all entitled to the COBRA. So if you choose to say, you know, I'm not going to cover myself, I'm just going to cover my wife or I'm just going to cover my spouse, employee or the qualified beneficiary. Qualified beneficiary is a popular term of who is actually, you know, entitled or continuing those benefits. Um, so the employee would be responsible um, for contributing and paying for the full cost of that COBRA. Plain and simple. So if you're an employer, uh, you, you've you understood that, uh, that COBRA was providing continued health coverage, um, 
the biggest reason of all, well, the biggest reason of all to do, to, to, to do it is to be compliant with the law. Uh, but the second the biggest is it doesn't cost you anything. This is this is uh, this is to provide continued co continued coverage for the employees. So if I'm an employer, and and you tell me if I'm getting any of this right or wrong here, uh, Heather. If I'm an employer, and I uh, let's say I'm paying 50 percent, uh, let's say uh, uh, health insurance premiums uh, for uh, a, a single person working for me, and I'll just make up a number, $500 a month. And I'm on a 50-50 plan where the, me as the employer, I'm paying 50% of that premium. The employee is paying 50% of that premium. So the employee pays $250 a month for their for their health coverage uh, for, for me. That person leaves, um, uh, all $500 of that to continue that coverage is uh, is the burden of the employee. You as the employer, just because you may have funded part of the health insurance, uh, in, in, in shared in that cost, which many most employers do, you're not obligated to do that for former employees. Do I have that right? Correct. And and that's that's a really great point that you bring up because it's actually a very popular question that we get on a daily basis is, you know, why is this so expensive? Like when I worked for my company, I was only paying this. So yes, it is the employer portion plus the employee portion. And then in most cases, it's that additional 2%. So you are now paying the full group rate of the plan where when you were actively working um, or on the active benefits, you know, as a full-time employee, you were only paying possibly, you know, just a portion of that because your employer was graciously contributing to that plan. But when you do go on to COBRA, um, you are responsible for that full cost of the group plan. Um, so you're still getting the benefit of the group rate, but you are now responsible for paying for the full premium and the employer is no longer required to offer a contribution towards that. Right, and so I think where where I would guide employers to be thinking about um, if you have, it, it, and, and we never think we're going to be audited by the Department of Labor, right? Um, and, and for the most part, you go through most of your career, and that doesn't happen. But it, it, you always have to treat these scenarios as a matter of when, not if, um, if it happens. And so maybe you've got an employee who. There, it's not a it's not a contentious relationship, right? But for some reason, you had a downsizing, you had a had a, ch a change in business, you had to had to let that employee go. You provide them uh, uh, their you follow the law, you provide them their COVID notification. But maybe you're a, a, a good generous employer. Maybe you maybe you cover 90% of their uh, health insurance premiums. And so if it's a family. Um, Maybe it, maybe you know it's probably more than a thousand dollars a month, but let's just for easy math say it's a thousand. Let the, their premiums are a thousand dollar a month, and you pay ninety percent. You're paying you're paying nine hundred out of the thousand thousand dollars a month as the employer. The employee sees a hundred dollars out of their come a month come out of their paycheck, um, and all of a sudden they leave, and now they got a they don't they don't have any money because they don't have a job, and they got a thousand dollar monthly bill for that insurance. That relationship can become contentious like that. Right, because Absolutely. they because this is there this is a double whammy time for them. They're out of a job, and all of a sudden uh, they they see their insurance rates go from hundred dollars to a thousand, and they're not gonna understand the nuance. We're we're forty eight minutes into a uh, into a conversation unpacking this. They're not gonna understand all the nuance of Cobra, right, uh, and, and all the legal requirements. They're going to say, my employer used to charge me $100 a month, and now that they fired me, they're charging me $1,000 a month. I'm going to call the Department of Labor. This isn't right, right? So, right. The, 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 and this is real world. This is, this is what happens, right? So, um, uh, this is why it is so critical to communicate, communicate, communicate with employees, and you have to follow the law uh, on COBRA because if you're not, these are the trigger events that, that results in audits. Again, am I overstating, Heather, anything else you would add, correct or add? No, uh, you are absolutely correct. You know, and as being an administrator, you know, we do hear that information. They do, you know, a lot of times they think it's, you know, personally an attack against them, um, but, you know, right. it's not. It's just, again, they're just paying the full premium, you know, where before they were seeing just a portion of that. And, and I mean, you take it's easy for us to take names and faces off of a in a conversation like this. 
sometimes you might not feel sorry for the employee because they're they were terrible <laughs> they were they, the, 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 a cultural disaster for your company and going to be rid of them or maybe it was a great employee and it's a downsizing of the business uh, none of that matters none of that matters it's it's following the law and right. how will employees react at, at a time whether they deserve to be fired or whether they didn't deserve to be fired how is that employee going to react at what maybe is probably the one of the top two or three or five worst moments of their life right right okay all right um we've gotten a lot of them but heather did, did we miss anything here for just uh cobra compliance issues like i'm thinking employee complaints where where uh where are the gotchas where do you see employers not who use our service we'll, 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 we won't go there but uh where do you see employers make mistakes here? I think the biggest one is just um, understanding what plans are subject to COBRA. And the other big one is just, you know, who's entitled to it. So, you know, again, we talked earlier about, you know, someone quitting versus being let go. Um, that's always a big one um, that gets questioned a lot, you know, whether it's, you know, through the client base we work with or even just outside of it. Um, and speaking just, you know, in forums in regards to this, those are always the big ones is employers may not realize, oh, you know, he was let go. So I offered him COBRA, but the other guy quit. Um, again, those are probably the two big things is just, you know, understanding what plans need to be offered. Um, the biggest, biggest, biggest one that I probably get questioned a lot is the flexible spending plans. Um, a lot of people don't realize that those are a true COBRA qualifying event. Um, and then the other one that does come up that I do like to bring up is the rate determination period. So this kind of goes into our conversation earlier about open enrollment and renewal. So, you know, you are on the group plan. Um, so, you know, as the employer goes through open enrollment and renewal to their benefit plans, the same opportunities have to be offered to someone continuing COBRA. Um, the rate determination period is a 12 month, so you can't increase premiums more than once a year when someone's on COBRA. Um, so when you're doing it through your open enrollment period, that's fine, you're allowed to do that, but you can't just increase the, the premiums along the way, you know, often just, you know, because you want to, or because you feel like someone's continuing outside of, you know, the group plan, because they are on your group plan. So, just making sure, you know, there are some times where rates might go down um, and that's okay, but they can't have an increase in that premium more than once a year, um, which would be the normal open enrollment period. Right. Um, so that's often a question we get to, but those are probably the big things. And then, you know, failure, failure to notify, um, you know, again, the Department of Labor understands things come up, you know, a file didn't work or something didn't generate properly, um, you know, just get the, that information out. That's probably the best advice I could get is, you know, is is just get that information out, even if you're unsure. Um, it's like, oh, well, they didn't want it anyway. Um, I, I know they were going to work with another company. Um, always just get that out because it's not for you to determine if they need it or not. Um, it's just a requirement to get that out. So those are probably my my takeaways um, and when it comes to the compliance questions. Of all the areas of compliance in, this, in the human capital management spectrum, anywhere from payroll taxes, to overtime laws, to sexual harassment training, uh, to COBRA, uh, 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 not just notification, but management. Um, I think I think that is kind of that continuum that I just uh, talked about. It really is, you know, you, you can't mess up your taxes or you're gonna, you're in hot water immediately, right? This is an area that uh, uh, we would say, it is your job to follow the law, period, and ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, we our experience would say uh the department of labor is gonna work with you to help you be compliant mostly to protect the rights of uh the employees so that they have the continued coverage that they are legally entitled to um if there's a business case to outsource this to someone else or uh or hire an hr certified professional who really understands this in the way that heather does it's more for the administration um Certainly, there are real fines. The Department of Labor has real teeth, um, uh, uh, but the the biggest burden here is uh, if I have an employee 
that is has is COBRA eligible for an 18 month period, I might not have a high turnover rate, but these employees start stacking on top of each other in uh, collecting payments, late payments, working between empl former employee um, who I don't have immediate contact with anymore uh, and the insurance carriers and the changing of those plans. It is just an administrative nightmare. And so uh, we would love it if you uh, would hire a, a shore. This is what we do uh, for companies and we can make this completely painless and uh, automated happens in the background. Uh, and when we take that administrative way, burden away for you, or you really need to hire someone who understands these issues to keep you compliant, uh, which I would say the self-serving way is, it, it, you know, outsourcing it to someone like us is probably pennies on the dollar, not just a fraction, but pennies on the dollar uh, compared to try hiring a, a, a full-time staff that this is what they do. Uh, uh, for anybody, say, under 100 employees, uh, when you naturally start to have to have more HR staff, certified HR staff uh, uh, in your business for all the, the other compliance reasons. So, uh, Heather, uh, thank you for your time today. Always learn every, sing every time I talk to you and appreciate your perspective on this topic. Great. Thanks for having me. And with that, uh, if there's any way we can help anybody in the payroll, human resources, benefits area, uh, you know, you guys focus on growth. Let us take the administrative burden off your hands. With that, until next week. Thank you.